Well, here we are at the penultimate episode for Rings of Power Season 2. The Great Siege of Eregion has begun, and Elrond is making out with his mother-in-law? What the heck is going on here? Let me just say this at the onset of this particular review and analysis. This episode has absolutely nothing to do with anything that Tolkien has ever written. When we talk about canon later on in this video, yeah, I really am actually not going to have a whole lot to say because we are so far afield from anything that Tolkien ever created that this is effectively its own unique show. So we're going to be talking about that quite a bit and very differently from most of our other videos. I will, on this uh, show, I will be talking about the battle. We are going to have a dedicated segment to talking about the fight that happened this episode, what worked, and what didn't. Hi there everyone, Lars here from Camille's Harem. Not just a podcast for novice writers by novice writers, but also a YouTube channel. By novice writers for novice writers. Because writing is an adventure, it's more fun with friends. Alright, so without any further ado, let's get into the review of this episode. This episode felt the most compact, the most action-packed, because... Finally, we're not jumping around from plotline to plotline to plotline to plotline to plotline. Plot Yay! Everything is happening in Region, except for the interesting events over in Moria, which end up being really, really dumb. So, let's quickly talk about that. Uh, because Durin the Fourth and Disa have stood up against the king and his great greed, all the other dwarves are like, Hey! This is awesome! Someone is finally standing up to the king! Yay, let us all rebel against the king Durin the Third as he molders on his throne surrounded by gold and petting his precious. <laughs> and, well, honestly, this would be interesting if it didn't just happen at the drop of a hat. The moment that Deesa and Durin are like, we will stand up to all of this extra digging, then all the other dwarves are like, that sounds great, we now follow you, you are our new king. And Elrond magically defies again the laws of time and space and just happens to show up in Moria after walking back to Linden <laughs> and then raising an army and then bringing them all the way to a region on the, the, the other side of the mountains. <laughs> All these things are happening in who knows what kind of space of time. Apparently, the siege against Eregion has been going on, should be going on at this point now for months, but whatever. So, Elrond meets with Durin the Fourth and says, I need you to come, and Durin's like, well, I'm going to overthrow my father, and smiles about it. Yay! Yes, I know it's a tense smile, but he's like, I'm going to overthrow my daddy. Whoopee! And Elrond's like, I'm going to trust you, my friend. You're going to take your dwarven legions, and you're going to smash into the exposed flank of the orcs, and we'll drive them from Eregion, and we will save the day without even having to step within Moria, within Mordor, I should say. And yay! Okay, you know what? I, I can like this strategy. The military brain of me is like, yes, yes, okay, I like this, I like this. But then the dwarves decide not to go anywhere. After a rather lackluster speech from Durin, in the fourth, which was absolutely unearned because, again, really, time doesn't exist in this show. All the dwarves just magically decide to obey the prince, who, at the beginning of the season, they were making fun of because he had been stripped of his rights and titles. So, yeah, contradictions abound. They're about to all go to war, and then, no! Durin the Third is going, and he is going down into the mines yet again, and Disa cannot stop him! He's going to bring down a wall of some kind. We don't know where, we don't know which shaft this is. We're just told that he will unleash something horrifying. Basically, it's implied the Balrog, but as some people point out to me, we've been told that the Balrog isn't going to show up until Season 4, so what's really going to happen? Don't know. The dwarves decide not to show up, which then will lead to Elrond lying in the mud, crying like an absolute wimp, when this is the guy who should be standing at the very front of battle <laughs> during the Battle of the Last Alliance, where he faces the orcs face on. 
Anyway, that little future aside, some people I've seen online are like, this is great, this shows how Elrond grows to become a great hero. No, I'm seeing Elrond being an absolute wimp and idiot. So talking about being a wimp and an idiot, let's get to the events of the Siege of Region. So, Region is being bombarded bombarded with catapult fire, not trebuchet fire. I'm already going to get into this a little bit. They are not being bombarded with trebuchets. Trebuchets are more of a tower-like catapult that flings the projectiles high into the air in a really crazy missile-like arc, and then the thing drops right on top of the defenders. If it scores a good hit on top of a wall, on top of a tower, you have a projectile that basically will drill its way, bore its way down, bringing down the entire wall or tower. What are being used are your typical uh, mangalettes, catapults, the malls that just poof, do the stereotypical fling a rock in a basic low arc into the city. Anyway, that aside, no trebuchets here in this episode, despite the fact they keep saying trebuchet, catapults are being used effectively to burn down the city of Eregion. Again, a city that's been implied to have been under siege now for weeks, if not months at this point, seems to be in a state of absolute chaos. These elves apparently do not have the brains to form bucket brigades and put out these fires. They're letting their city burn down as they're running around like ants who have lost their queen. And it makes good sense because Celebrimbor has not shown up and Anatar, even though everyone's like, Anatar, you will save us. He is leading us. Anatar is not doing anything except saying, stay vigilant at the wall. Stay vigilant at the wall. They will make a ground assault eventually. And they're like, wait, a ground assault? How's that going to happen? Well, the orcs decide to turn their catapults against the mountains and create a ford. Or, more like it actually ends up being a dam. They should have actually used this as a ford, and I'm going to get to that a little bit later once we actually start talking about the battle proper, but this is actually a pretty smart choice on Adar's part. Get rid of the river so that way it's easier to bring the entire army to bear rather than going over the bridge, which funnels them, which puts them into a bottleneck, making it easier to slay them. Not with arrows and with stones, mind you. All the people of Regan have to do is heat up a bunch of water, which they have in abundance, and just pour scalding water on top of the orcs, and it will kill them with second and third degree burns. And they don't have to risk many people in doing that. So it makes sense why Adar is doing this. This is really smart. However, what's really dumb is that it only takes a handful of stones to bring down a mountain. Yes, that is dumb. This is a cool idea, but the feat of engineering of literally bringing down a mountain is something else, which again, we're going to get more into when I start talking about the battle proper. Well, with the river dammed, the orcs can now finally sweep across the muddy river and attack the walls of Eregion, bringing up their siege weapons, and the fight is now fully on. Well, Celebrimbor has finally discovered that there's something off. The mouse that was seen earlier is just an illusion, working on clockwork. And I actually do like this part, that Celebrimbor, while working on the rings, is smart enough, cognizant enough of what's going on around him, that he finally realizes that something is off. Time is not passing the way that it should. The mouse is moving in a clockwise order, literally going by according to the clock and in and in a the turn of a clock around his uh, around his uh, forge. Things just don't seem right. He finally paying attention to his to his own reflection sees just how dirty and tired and worn he is confronts Sauron, breaks the illusion, and tries to let everyone within Eregion know, this is Sauron, we got to imprison him immediately, get rid of him, kill him if we have to. He bleeds black blood because he showed me. It wasn't Mithril that he gave me, he gave me his blood to forge the rings for men. So remember the whole deal about how you needed to have like Mithril and everything to create these rings of power? Yeah, that's been totally whoop, thrown out the window. So all of that world building, all of that lore from season one, yeah, don't worry about it, don't worry about it. it this is stupid. This is dumb right here. They're contradicting their own world building. <laughs> 
In any case, moving on from that, which yes, I understand, with the powers of Sauron and Celebrimbor combined, of course they can create other rings, and that's the point, they didn't need the stupid little Mithril subplot in order to have this cool thing about forging the rings. In fact, if they had just said, hey, Mithril would make the rings stronger than using other than any other material, would have actually made the switcheroo for Sauron's blood even more malicious. Because since you know that other that you can use other substances to make the rings, then using the blood of Sauron would obviously be the best way of him making these rings so that he can control the people who wear them, as opposed to the rings that are worn by the elves because they were not forged using the blood of Sauron. If you had made that point in this season, it would have made way more sense. However, that isn't made, and a great opportunity is lost. Well, Celebrimbor is not believed by anyone, especially when he takes his own nameless, I know she's not nameless, but the name of the smithy that no one can remember and flings her over the wall after Anatar promised that he would protect her, and then an orc violently, viciously puts an axe into her chest and she dies. Well, Celebrimbor is imprisoned back again in his tower to finish the rings. He finishes them. He can't destroy them because they are rings of power. This is stupid because you actually should be able to destroy any of the rings of power other than the one ring by using any special magical means necessary. Only the one ring requires a very specific way to destroy it. That aside, <laughs> Celebrimbor decides he's going to escape imprisonment by cutting off his own thumb, thereby rendering his days as a master craftsman over because he's now completely maimed. But he's able to then pull his hand on out of his links. This is a guy who's able to create special magical rings. You think he'd be able to find another better way of breaking his non-magical golden shackles? Anyway, Celebrimbor is maimed, and he now wanders about the city. <laughs> if someone would at least listen to me. Well, luckily, he's going to meet Galadriel. What's been happening with Galadriel this whole time, you wonder? Well, Galadriel, who's been a prisoner of Adar this whole time, is used as a bargaining chip to prevent the ultimate cavalry charge of Elrond into the flank of the orcs, as he, as he intends to lead the armies of Gilgalad right up to the wall of Eregion distract the orcs long enough so that way the armies of Moria, which are pretty far away, will happen to march in an entire night and strike the orcs un unopposed in their rear and in their other side flank. While that sounds absolutely ridiculous because you can't march that far in just one night, it is a sound strategy. However, Elrond stops the entire force of elves, the entire great cavalry charge, because he sees Galadriel and can't bring himself to have her killed, even though he had promised. And so he meets with Adar, and Adar's like, if you give me the ring, Nenya, then I will let Galadriel go, and I will destroy Sauron myself. And Elrond's like, if you want the ring, which I foolishly brought with me, then you'll have to take it from me with a blade to my throat on the field of battle. And Adar's like, well, oh, fine by me. I'm totally fine with that. And then Elrond's like, since Galadriel's going to die, allow me to have just one parting moment with her. And then he kisses her, slips her the tongue, as well as a lockpick, so that way she can break herself free later on in the episode. Now, a lot of people are like, what the heck is going on here with this? And others are like, it's a chaste kiss. It was a kiss to help break her free. They are the best of friends. Here's the thing. I actually don't mind if another character is going to kiss a character who they shouldn't. The thing is this, is that this is a kiss that didn't need to have happened at all. Because Galadriel should never have been in the situation. This is wholly contrived, and there have to have been a better way of slipping her her the 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 lock pick other than kissing her. This was completely contrived by the writers to have yet another shipping moment and to have people react by going, Oh my gosh! So the writers can be like, ha, 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 we're getting you to talk about our show. Aren't we so brilliant? Even bad press is good press. Well, with the lock slipped to Galadriel, Galadriel eventually picks herself free, and she goes free, disguising herself as an orc, and then seeing how orc women are there to support the orc men, how the orcs don't necessarily wish to die, she gets a new perspective of the orcs. <gasps> Maybe she shouldn't just commit orc genocide anymore. 
While it would be interesting to have a moment where Galadriel realizes that there's more to the orcs than what she once thought, the problem is, is that this is all crammed into a situation where it doesn't really belong. Having this moment of realization shouldn't happen in the midst of an escape and a massive battle where the orcs are trying to murder every one of your kin who are in the city that they're besieging. So, uh, this is just really silly. I like the idea of Galadriel learning a little bit and being a little bit humbled, but this it came at the wrong place and time, place and time, in order for the message to really sink in. Well, she is saved from those vile orc women in the backfield by Orondir showing up and then helping smuggle her into the city. Yes, that the orcs can't get into. Huzzah! And there she meets Celebrimbor, as Celebrimbor has his own Samwise Gamgee moment of how the lights must endure. And even though we know that Galadriel is to blame for everything that's happened in this season, because she is a moron who allowed Sauron to again become evil and empower him to do everything that he's done, the story still goes out of its way to say, no, you were right, Galadriel, even when she's been humbled. This is an episode that absolutely is meant to humble Galadriel, which I'm here for because that means that she can finally have real character development by breaking this stupid girl boss facade that the writers have decided to give her. No, Caleb Brimbor says that she was right. And he's like, I have forgiven you for everything because we were both deceived. But you must go on, my lady Galadriel, because you will be the defender of the light. And the light must endure and it endures in the greatest of darkness. And while I have to give it to the actor for Celebrimbor for doing his best to deliver a Shakespearean performance, which he is a Shakespearean actor, so he's killing it in this scene. This show does not deserve that moment because it is totally unearned and was not set up and it validates Galadriel when Galadriel is the reason for everything that's going on wrong. Crap, this is not the beautiful wise elven queen that fans of Lord of the Rings have loved for decades now. This is an imposter. So, what about the battle proper? What's going on here? Well, Elrond decides to lead part of his army into the orc flank as, as planned, while another small contingent is meant to wrap around, meet the orcs, in, meet the dwarves in the rear in order to fight the orcs from there and smash them between hammer and anvil and against the walls of a region. All that Elrond needs to do is ensure that the walls do not fall. And the orcs are bringing up quite an array of various siege engines as they try to tear down the wall. Adar is watching this as the one dumb daddy orc is all like, You said you wouldn't get any more of us killed! No! This isn't right! I just want to go home! I just want to go home! I just want to go home! And the other orcs are like, Let's have blood! Yay! So... The, the message of, of good orcs is lost in the ridiculousness, again, of this moment where only one orc is really pleading against it, who's supposed to be the, the words of wisdom to, again, validate what Galadriel has said, while the rest of the orcs go to battle, and it is impressive enough it's definitely way better than anything that we were given in season one but again i will get into what's the good and what's the bad of this particular battle so we have this back and forth against the wall and there is this device the ravenger which it's hard to tell if this is a battering ram or if this is meant to be basically a crane that rips the wall apart and it, apparently it's explosive as well because Elrond gets the gets one of the other elves who we're supposed to care about, who we only hear her name once to my knowledge, and I've completely forgotten it because it's only ever said once, and she has her own legless moment where she shoots the thing, it blows up as she's being riddled by arrows from unseen archers, apparently by archers on the wall? <laughs> from her own people, apparently? blows up the Ravenger, saves the day. You then have the big troll who has been, <gasps> who's been foreshadowed this whole time, the Eater of Drakes, the Slayer of Mountain Giants and Stone Giants, who comes on out, Brah! he's killing orcs and elves alike, and he actually goes down faster than the cave troll from the Fellowship of the Ring. This guy has been built up as an absolute beast and monster, 
is destroyed really quickly by Elrond and Arondir. Then Adar brings his whole army up against the wall. King Gilgadaddy shows up with whatever is left of the cavalry and does what a king should, stay with his people, and he's wielding his famous spear, slaying all of these orcs left and right. The battle has reached its climax. Arondir dies at the hands of Adar. So that way we don't have to worry about this character anymore, and this is why the actor was actually really upset, because he had been promised that he would have five seasons as one of the main characters and have one of the ships that was meant to rival uh, Arwen and Aragorn, but because the actress who played his lover decided to leave the show, Arondir had to be killed off, and now Theo is going to be left without a parental figure, which now sets up him to become one of the ring race by accepting Sauron's ring because he's just so upset and distraught, and it will do really well because he obviously needs his sword and the arm fixed, but because he can't get that since that sword's with a are now, he will now take the ring and it will be his new <sighs> oh, oh, substance abuse. Well, when day finally breaks, the elves hold out for the entire night. The wall still has not fallen, and the elves are now apprised to the fact that Sauron is on the loose. Aregion is rising up in resistance. The sun rises, the sun hits these vampire orcs. And the vampire orcs who once went sizzle in the sun are now able to walk in the sunlight and fight the last few elves as Elrond realizes that the armies of Durin the Fourth are not coming to him as his one ally comes riddled with arrows. We've been abandoned! <gasps> and drops dead. And then Elrond cries! in the mud, surrounded by fires and dead bodies, and Adar comes, beats him up, takes the ring, and the walls of Eregion finally fall, and the armies of the orcs surge through the breach, as Sauron turns the blades of the guards against one another, and finally, he will have all the rings for men. Okay then, so that is the episode. Let's talk about the canon violations and the canon adherence. Once again, canon is essential in order to make a coherent story. If you are doing an adaptation and you decide to throw the canon out the window, the fans of the original story will have a very hard time following and appreciating the work that you're doing. Also, if you go against the canon of your own story, it creates massive plot holes which will undermine your story overall. So we want to avoid all of that. What we get in this episode <laughs> is nothing of any real canon value, except that Gil that uh, Gilgalad is riding around with his spear. His famous spear that allows him to stand up to all kinds of champions of darkness. Yay! Okay, we got that. And, and I will acknowledge that. Other than that, everything in this episode has nothing to do with anything that Tolkien wrote. That's not Elrond. Elrond, who is the herald, a great champion, a great warrior, who stood up to so many enemies, would have won. He would have, he would have charged into these orcs and just destroyed them. These orcs are a silly rabble caught in the sunlight. They should get wiped out. Eregion fell to a great army led by Sauron, who swept across the region, destroying all of the cities, finally getting Celebrimbor and impaling him upon a spear and then using his body as a standard. That is what we should be getting in this, but no, that's not what we're going to get. Not at all. We're actually going to lose one of Sauron's most badass moments because these writers are incompetent. Adar never existed, and uh, Gilgalad would have been way smarter than anything we see here. Galadriel would never have been caught in this situation whatsoever. The rings cannot be combined with Sauron's helm in order to kill Amaya. That just doesn't happen. Bal the Balrog will not be woken up until the Third Age. During the Third and during the Fourth did not live at the same time. So, <sighs> oh boy. I mean, except for, of course, when during the Fourth was born, but... Whatever! <laughs> you get what I'm saying. They were not true contemporaries of each other in terms of rule. Oh boy, so many things that just do not line up. This is not anything from the story. Anyone who says that's like, I've loved the books and the show is doing a great job, 
No, as far as an adaptation goes, it's not doing a great job. Now then, this episode, this episode is not the best within the series. I still say that episode 5 of season 2 is the best episode of Rings of Power thus far. This episode, if you were to turn it on, turn your back, and do other things, would be a perfectly great bit of background noise because all of the fighting and action that's going on, and you can imagine in your brain way cooler things than what are happening here on the screen. So as far as canon goes, there's really only one thing that I can praise it for, and that is Gilgalad's spear. There you go. <laughs> this episode had this episode fails. It has a point. 0.01% canon accuracy. It's just dumb. So then how does it stand up in terms of an original story? So as far as the battle goes, well, you know, it's, it's enough. I'm going to talk more in depth here pretty soon about what makes a good battle, but in terms of just I need action in my life, you get action. The action is there. The pacing is far better than a lot of the other episodes. I'm still upset that when we get to a great moment of, of tension and of drama, half the time we cut away then to something else that's going on. The side plot with Celebrimbor could have been far more condensed in order to preserve the tension of the overall fight. And the whole kiss thing with Galadriel, that was just in there for shock. I would, I would have had Elrond embrace her and and just be and just be like Galadriel, you are my you are my dearest friend, and I know I swore to you that I would that I would let you die if it came to that, but I just couldn't bring myself because I am going to save everyone in Oregion. Make him say something grandiose that he can't that he can't uphold. But as the orcs like, <laughs> of course you can't save Oregion. We will destroy it. That then while they are distracted by their laughter, he slips to her the lock. Pick. If that had happened, that would have worked out way better than the kiss, because the kiss is just awkward. If you know the canon, oh my gosh, this is stupid in the extreme. And even if you don't know the canon, this just seems dumb. Why would he kiss her? Because their relationship was never more than platonic. When people are like, you can have a platonic kiss? Yes, how many of you platonically slip uh, your best friend the tongue? How many? How many? I'm waiting. <laughs> because that is not something that normally happens so the whole kiss scene was just there for shock and while shocking moments can be great within a story the shock has to make sense in some kind of way it's like oh my gosh i did not see that happening but now that i think about it yeah 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 no that makes sense no upon reflection this kiss does not make any sense again coming back also to celebrimbor's Sam speech is basically what it's meant to be. It's perfectly functional. Like, it makes sense. And I'm actually okay. Again, with the delivery, it's good. And the speech itself isn't bad. We were like, this is the essence of Tolkien. If you want the essence of Tolkien, you might actually want to properly use something that Tolkien wrote in its proper context. But because you guys, these writers, have continuously misused and abused everything that Tolkien wrote, I don't expect them to do that. So the speech is the speech is fine. What I would have preferred, as far as the speech goes, is that we get this with Celebrimbor facing Sauron. Galadriel coming in and being like... I will stop you, Sauron! It sounds like, oh, I already have the rings, I have everything I want, you will lose to me now! And Celebrimbor then delivering his speech, defiant to the end, in front of Sauron. That would have been really cool. Celebrimbor maiming himself just was dumb. I, I don't like that because there's so many other ways in which he could have gotten himself out of that situation. This is the writer's trying to again shock you this is characters again being just supremely stupid I, I don't like it it doesn't work they have made Celebrimbor really dumb uh, uh, throughout the series but for a guy who is smart enough to figure out finally how he is being tricked and then stand up to Sauron and then even be willing to face the ridicule of all of his people is a guy who, yes, is a man who would be, ter be determined enough to take off his own thumb, but a guy who's also smart enough to realize that he doesn't need to take off his own thumb in order to escape. 
Another thing that this is a huge bit of canon violation, and the problem is that it's not just canon violation within the world of J.R.R. Tolkien, but also canon violation for what they themselves have set up, is that when Sauron then takes control of the elves and has the elves killing each other so that way he can escape, why didn't he do this with the orcs? Now people are going to say, it's because the orcs didn't let him in. This is a bunch of crotch. For a guy that Adar says tricked him and who had the orcs already under his own power beforehand, how did he lose it? Don't know. This is a contrivance in order for him to not show off his amazing powers, which he apparently had all along. Sauron based on what we see in this episode and in the previous episode, should have wiped the floor with Adar and all the other orcs back at the beginning of back at the beginning of the season, rather than being shanked in a weird prison brawl and then becoming a goo monster for a thousand years or more. No, what you've shown us of Sauron no longer lines up with the Sauron that was presented to us earlier. It does not fit. And that's the reason why canon is so important. So within this own world, within this own show's world building, if we considered that Tolkien had never existed, this still absolutely falls apart. They do not adhere to their own world building. Their characters are inconsistent. They make stupid decisions. And there's so many things that the moment that you begin to really contemplate what's happening within the story, and you compare this fight scene to other fight scenes, and no, I'm not going to be all like, oh, the ride of the Rohirrim, as opposed to the ride of Elrond. Look, I'm not even going to compare that. Let's actually compare this to Kingdom of Heaven. The Kingdom of Heaven does a better job with the Siege of Jerusalem than this show has done so far with two episodes for the Siege of Oregion, which had more runtime for the Siege of Oregion than they had for the runtime for the Siege of Jerusalem in Kingdom of Heaven. That is sad. And if we do wish to compare what they have done here in this show to what was done in the Lord of the Rings trilogy, and people are like, hey, 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 you, you can't compare this to the siege of, uh, Sieges of Helm's Deep and Minas Tirith because those happened at the end of those movies after so many hours of setup? Well, let me remind you of this. In order to get here to this episode, episode 7 of season 2, we have had 14 episodes, roughly 14 hours of runtime to build up to this moment. You mean to tell me that you could not pull off, in some kind of way, a well-earned battle that was properly set up and properly executed after 14 hours of build-up and character development? And might I remind you that Arondir dies in this episode? What is Arondir's character arc in all of this? Please tell me, what has Arondir earned or gained from any of this experience? What have you, as a viewer, gained from watching a Ron Deere's adventure? The only things that I can pull out of a Ron Deere's personal journey are little bits of, you know what, maybe we should care about people, maybe we should set aside prejudice, which are great messages. The problem is, is that that's not embodied in the way that he acts. He just says things that the plot needs him to say, and most of the time he's there to kick butt and take names and go on and save the day in really cool fashion before he gets taken down like a punk by, by Adar. So, this is just stupid. So, if we were to, again, if we were to consider The Rings of Power as its own original story without Tolkien having ever existed, these are bad characters, this is a bad setup, this is bad execution, yes, we have action. And you know what? Mindless action is fun in the moment. I will absolutely agree to that. I myself have written fun, mindless action. Plenty of it. However, I will also be one of the first people, even though this is what I've written, to say that while this was fun to write and probably fun to read in the moment for you, it will not be remembered a year down the road. Unless it is really awesome action or meaningful action. So... Let's turn our attention to writing battles. Writing chaos and characters and armies smashing into each other, stuff going kaboom, things being broken and destroyed, catapults flinging stuff left and right is all a lot of fun. Again, I enjoy writing that stuff myself. However, if you want to write a battle that is going to be truly well-remembered and well-regarded, not something that people are going to point at and laugh, or even worse, actually, 
that people turn on and turn their back to because they need mindless noise. That's that's how most people will treat this series in the future and how people even treat it now. I have talked with people who say that they like the show and I say, what do you like about it? And what they have told me, and I kid you not, two people, one of them being my brother-in-law said, it's fun to turn this on so that way I can focus on my work. I have action happening and I don't need to pay attention to it. If that's what's happening here, I can give you soundtracks of battle and really awesome musical soundtracks from stuff like Braveheart or the original Lord of the Rings trilogy that will do just as well and keep you just as well pumped. Because if you're not paying attention to the story, then why do we even have the story here? <laughs> so, the Battle of Region. What does it do well? Well, the orcs are actually acting fairly intelligently. Rather than wasting lives by rushing across the by rushing across the bridge to attack the main gates, which would be an obvious bottleneck and failure, would be an absolute slaughterhouse, they decide that they are going to dam the river. Now then, to properly dam a river requires a massive feat of engineering, and you can't just simply collapse a mountain with a few rocks hurled by catapult. That does not happen. It would have been really, really cool to see orcs going on up there, weakening the cliff sides with small little explosions, of which they're capable of, or pounding away at bits of rock, setting up a massive cliff face to fall once they begin an avalanche, and thereby starting the avalanche, and then having it crash into the river. In order to properly dam a river, you actually have to create a lake for that river to flow into. By them just simply dropping the stones down there, what it would do is it would divert the river and create marshlands, which would actually make it even harder for them to lay siege to the city because the water would flow eventually back into the riverbed itself and make the crossing impossible, except for where they've created the ford. I thought at first that what they were going to do was not dam up the river, but actually do something that Alexander the Great did to defeat the city of Tyre, where they built a rampart of rubble to reach right up to the city and then fuse the city to the mainland by then putting earth over it. Yes, it took a lot of time, but it made it possible then for the armies of Alexander the Great to cross to Tyre and then lay siege to it properly without wasting tons of manpower trying to cross the, the sea and getting drowned in the process while dealing with projectiles. That's what the orcs should have been doing right here. Create a ford that would allow them to come around to the other side of the city where they don't have to worry about the river and then lay siege properly to it without the Anduin getting in the way. Now then, let's say that they had properly dammed up the Anduin. If you drain a river, it's going to be an absolute boggy nightmare. Any soldier in heavy armor who steps in there is going to sink easily up to their waist in mud. They're not going anywhere, let alone any siege equipment. But the moment that the Anduin stops flowing, they charge on across. Now, the reason why I bring this up, because this, yes, this, people might say this is a bit of a nitpick. The reason why I bring this up is because the more that you can tap into elements of realism within your story, even if it is fantastic, makes people buy it even more. One of the reasons why I love the fights in the first two Stormlight Archive books is because even though, yes, you're fighting against alien bug people who can jump really far and there's these giant lobster dragons and there's magic and whatnot for the people who don't have magic who are running from plateau to plateau they need to have transportable bridges that need to be laid down and then soldiers need to need to form a shield wall or cavalry needs to be used to break up enemy formations to allow the rest of the army to funnel across as fast as they can before getting caught in a bottleneck actual strategies being used to uh, to overcome the geographical limitations of battle. A river is a limitation that needs to be overcome. Rivers are very important uh, for defensive positions, even in modern warfare. And even if you drain a river, you can't just simply cross it because your artillery and your heavily armed personnel will get stuck in the mud. You have to wait for it to dry out. So, let's say that the orcs had then actually waited. Let, let's, let's just say that they had waited it on out. Okay, now they charge across the, the, the water. They now drive across the dried out Anduin bed. <laughs> and then begin to lay siege to the city. Okay, then. That is, that, that's fine and all. 
Why are there random fires in the mud? Come on! <laughs> so again, realism. The moment that you even begin to stop to think about, wait a second, does this actually work? You realize, oh no, it really doesn't. Whereas, for instance, compare it to the Siege of Helm's Deep or the Siege of Minas Tirith, yes, massive three, uh, massive 30-story ladders. I know they're not that big. Let's just say that they're massive 30-foot ladders made of metal with massive hooks to latch on. Those are really heavy. And what we see in the movie is that you have hundreds of orcs pulling on pulleys and ropes to swing these ladders up because they still, even though this is fantastical and this would never work in real life, we're still at least adhering to some rules of physics in order to make this work out. Or for the Siege of Minas Tirith, you have huge siege towers covered in armor so that way they're harder to take down, pushed by massive trolls in order for them to advance. It makes sense. Yes, it's fantastical. This normally would not work. But hey, the siege tower makes sense. The trolls make sense. The movement forward makes sense. Everything is working out here. Now then, I know that the writers really wanted to, again, up Peter Jackson by saying, hey, look, the, these orcs have trenches and these orcs have special trench fires, which are in the Return of the King. Yes, during the Siege of Minas Tirith within the book, the orcs dig trenches around the city and ignite them in order to prevent any sorties from coming out of the city. And then the orcs move around those strategically placed fires to bring up their siege towers distract the defenders while they bring Grand up the main causeway and then attack the gate to bring it down. The strategy is all there. That makes good sense. When we then see what is happening here with this Siege of Eregion, Adar does not take the opportunity to envelop the entire city and attack it at multiple weak points. And so he says there should be one weak point here in the wall. I don't know how these orcs determine that there's a weak point in that wall, but they decide to go there and they send their Ravenger to then go tear down the wall while the rest of the orcs hit just one part of the wall and try to overwhelm the elves there. That is bad siegecraft. In a siege, you want to press the defenders on all sides. You want to pin the defenders with your overwhelming attacking force at various places and make them think that you might actually ascend the wall or break through a gate in a different place than where you actually intend to get through. When I wrote my book, Bleed Steam and Steel, there is a large steampunk siege. It was really fun to write. And during this siege, all of this weight is being thrown against the main gate. It's a huge frontal assault, while a smaller force it then goes around the city to a place where the defenders say, look, there are these massive, there are these massive jagged mountains right here, which could be crossed. But because they're so jagged, they're so, the pathways are so narrow, we only need a few defenders here. We don't have to worry about it. The attackers then bring their best soldiers around to this place that is lightly defended while they throw everything else at the main gate and then send the attacking force onto the wall, not to get into the city, but now to then rush along the wall, clear it of defenders, and leave a massive section of the city open for other smaller units to throw up ladders and, and, uh, and siege engines to now cross over while they then head for the gate. And now everyone's like, they're going for the gate, they're going for the gate, while an entire wall has now been exposed for soldiers to now climb over. And of course, they still intend to throw open the gates and allow the main army to pour into the city. That is still the goal, but should that fail, there's an entire wall, an entire section of the city, which has now been cleared, and now they can send their own people over at their leisure in order to invade the city and cause chaos in the rear. That is strategy. That works. What Adar is doing here doesn't really fit. And unleashing the troll, whose name I don't think anyone remembers, because again, we only hear it like once or twice, they only refer to the troll as him in this episode, as the troll comes on in, yes, he's going for the Ravenger to try to use it as a battering ram to break through the wall. This troll would have been far better employed somewhere else to pull away the attention of the elves away from the Ravenger, so that way the orcs can continue using the siege engine to break through the wall. Again, diversion, pinning people down while you then aim for the proper weakness. 
What Adar actually does, though, in this episode, in terms of sending in various waves and whatnot, is actually very, very smart. While the show is written in such a way to make us feel like Adar is just throwing away lives pointlessly, the fact of the matter is, when you're conducting a siege, you are going to lose soldiers. And Adar has actually held back his greatest forces for later. He's being smart. He's only sending in wave after measured wave after measured wave of soldiers and equipment to bring down the wall. He doesn't send in any more than he absolutely needs to. This is actually very smart, but instead the show presents it as he's wasting all of these other lives and therefore he is a villain. And I actually have to say, look, Adar, there are some things that you do that are really stupid and there's things that you do that are inconsistent, but the way that you send in measured wave after measured wave against the wall makes good sense. That is good. And I actually did like some of the inventiveness to the orc siege engines. The thing, though, about calling this one thing the Ravenger, I was like, what exactly is this? Having a covered battering ram is absolutely canon to real life. The covered battering rams are, for instance, were used to attack Jerusalem by the Romans were an absolute bane to the Jewish defenders. And so a covered battering ram here makes good sense. Though having a covered pulley crane device to rip apart the wall was a little bit silly to me. And the fact that these orcs, only a handful of orcs, are now pulling on chains and ripped down the rest of the wall, yeah, that's also really dumb. There is a cool moment of real world history where uh, King Richard the Lionheart paid men to tear stones out from underneath a tower, thereby collapsing the tower. That would have made good sense if the orcs had then, uh, had then used proper mining techniques of burrowing into the mud, undermining the foundations of the wall, and then bringing the wall down. That would have been really cool. That would have made sense. So as far as this battle goes, there are some things that happen that make sense as far as what the orcs are doing, but then there's also a lot of things that just seem kind of dumb. Realism goes out the window a lot in this episode. And what the elves do is just dumb. So, so dumb. For instance, you cannot stop a massive cavalry charge at the drop of a hat. It doesn't work that way. That much momentum would absolutely crash into the orcs and flatten them and kill Galadriel in the process. It would also kill all of the knights in the front line, but whatever, because those people are horribly armored. Elrond's tactics on a general wide view make sense, but when we dive into the minutia of tactics, it becomes incredibly sloppy. And, be, and this is actually what should have been done. As the orcs go into the mud and are bogged down in the mud, that then the elves are like, okay, shoot arrows, shoot arrows, shoot arrows, and make that an absolute killing field for the orcs. Draw them up out of the mud onto the flatlands and then smash them with the cavalry in order to wipe them out. Yes, that would then remove the face-to-face -face combat that the elves were supposed to have had, but it would have made far more sense for, for Elrond or for, Gil or for Gilgalad to make that particular call, rather than simply throwing away lives by throwing them into this death trench. Which again, I know the writer's going to say, well, World War I, well, Tolkien's experience, well, what was actually written for the Siege of Minas Tirith, to which I say, yes, and the Siege of Minas Tirith had actual tanks in it. And you want to know what? No, there was no trench warfare in Minas Tirith itself. There was no one who jumped into those trenches because those trenches were filled with fire. <laughs> so, no, screw you, riders. I see what you're planning right there. Now, again, if you just want mindless action and fun, this episode has it. It does. However, if you want to write a battle that, that really resonates, it needs to be intelligent. Another thing is this, is that the emotional stakes really need to be there. I did not feel Elrond's pain when Durin didn't show up. Part of that was because you showed me that Durin wasn't going to show up. So I knew that the, or that the doors weren't going to set up, so I wasn't emotionally pained when they didn't. Another thing is this, is that, again, Arondir needed a good proper character arc before dying. He doesn't have one. Therefore, I don't feel anything for Arondir when he dies. And then for the nameless elf archer lady who destroys the Ravenger, that would have been cool if I knew who she was! I needed to know her. I didn't know her. Therefore, when she died, I really didn't care. Or for taking down the troll. This was meant to be a great moment. I needed to see more of this troll and the destruction that he could bring. But I didn't. 
And there weren't other trolls to help to compare him to within the story. Therefore, this is just a big bad who's a one-and-done villain. There's nothing there for me to really care about. And Galadriel breaking free, okay, so she has a moment where she's like, so this is the true lives of orcs. While that's actually good, I, I would have wanted to have this not thrown into the middle of the chaos of combat. Because when we're in the middle of combat, we want that flow. And they keep pausing the flow to go to Galadriel, to go to Celebrimbor, to go to Anatar slash Sauron. And so the flow of the battle is just getting broken up. There's so many things that are just done sloppily. And it's just sad because this episode could have been really good on just the action alone. But instead, it's passable. I'm not going to say it's completely awful because it isn't. It's just passable. And for a billion dollars worth of investment, for 14 hours worth of setup, you give me passable? Of course people will compare this to Helm's Deep. Of course they will compare it to Minas Tirith. Because with less runtime, we had better setup, better payoff, better character arcs, better action, with less money, and with less investment of time. The writing for this show is lazy so really quick to round this off other than writing battles what can we really learn from this that might help you then as an author what i would recommend is this other than thinking a little bit about realism and how you can mesh this up with fantasy for some really awesome combinations what I would say is this, is that when you're writing action, remember this. It isn't just about that characters are fighting and swords are going swing swing and guns are going bang bang, but rather it is about what's brought us here. What have the characters done that have brought us here that really matter? What are their character arcs? How will this battle help them to fulfill their character arc or take them on the next necessary step of their journey of development? Think about that and how that works. This could have been an excellent episode for advancing the characters of Celebrimbor, of Galadriel, of Elrondir, of Elrond, of Adar. And while we get glimpses of what it could have been, it continued to fall short. Because this show is about the plot happening, not about the characters. And a story lives or dies by its characters. So please, hold that in consideration, bear that in mind. Once this season is completed, and we've been able to see the entirety of the Siege of Oregion, I will do a breakdown, if people wish, I will do a breakdown of the battle in its entirety, and we'll discuss how it actually works overall. And yes, we will compare it to at least the Siege of Helm's Deep, to say, okay then, what did the Siege of Helm's Deep do well? And what might have it done wrong, if it did do anything wrong? And what did the Siege of Oregion do well? And obviously, what did it do wrong? And what can we as authors learn from that? So, until we get to that video, but especially until we get to the next episode, the final episode of this wasted season for the Rings of Power, <laughs> if you're looking for far better entertainment, battles that will truly thrill you and that you will enjoy, I highly recommend that you check out my book, Bleed, Steam, and Steal. And for anyone who's like, Lars, you don't know what you're talking about, I will say this. Read my book, Bleed, Steam, and Steal. Compare the battles to Bleed, Steam, and Steal to the Siege of Oregion. Then you and I can have a good long chat. Because then you can compare my work to the work of J.D. Payne and Patrick McKay, and we can see who did better. I'm ready for that conversation. I want that conversation because it will help me improve. That's the kind of conversation these guys don't want to have because they think that they've done everything perfectly. And oh boy, oh boy, the more that I listen to these guys, the more that I watch of any sort of interview with them, it's clear that all they're doing is just ripping off other people's works and thinking that they're geniuses for it. And yes, I will say this as a little bit of quick advice before I close off here, that we as authors, of course, we do pull inspiration from the works of other people. At times, we as authors do steal ideas from other people and we make them our own. But what makes that theft fun for other people is that we truly make it an interesting part of our own story rather than blatantly lifting what other people have done and mishmashing it in a weird perverse mix and match game hoping that somehow this creates a coherent story that's what jd Payne and patrick mckay have been doing and that's why this show fails because it is a parody of not just the lord of the rings but of 
dozens of other shows and movies, even down to anime or long forgotten 80s classics <laughs> or things that they or just moments from other shows that they really enjoyed. Like, wouldn't it be fun if we threw that into the Lord of the Rings? Yay, let's do that. Rather than actually worrying about writing an interesting story with great characters. That is why The Rings of Power fails. So, until we get to the next episode, looking at the finale for The Rings of Power Season 2, I bid thee all, choose.